Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's study hub and QuesMed collaboration on SBAs in pulmonary fibrosis. We're joined by the amazing Dr. Jamie. If you've seen him before, he's a great, great teacher. And um, I'm so excited to have him teaching today's session. Um, so before we get started, the session will be recorded and up on the um, study hub website in about 10 days, but it'll also feature on the QuesMed YouTube channel, which is really great. Um, so you'll be able to access it through there. The recording will be available, but the slides won't be. Um, throughout the event, there'll be um, uh, SBAs and there'll be the opportunity for you guys to answer using the polls, uh, polls feature. So each question will be up for around about one minute um, and you guys will have the opportunity to answer that. So please do. We have a Q&A feature right at the bottom of the screen, if you can see it. If you can click that and if you have any questions, please use that feature during the event. And then at the end of the session, um, Dr. Jamie will go through those questions and we'll be able to do, uh, we'll be able to do that. Um, and at the end of the session, if you guys are watching this on the study hub website and um, if you scroll down there's the access to the feedback form if you guys could feed uh, fill in that feedback form it'd be really helpful for our awesome educators to know what to do um, next time and how to better their um, better their events um, and if you're watching this on zoom no worries I'll send the um, link to the form uh, to the feedback form in the chat so you would just scroll down and you'll be able to answer it like that um, and yeah, that's enough of my rambling. Um, over to Dr. Jamie um, for this awesome event in SBAs in pulmonary fibrosis. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Zanya. Um, so yeah, I'm Jamie Arbery. Um, I'm a doctor currently training in London and I'm gonna be giving this session today on pulmonary fibrosis. So it's gonna contain nine um, SBAs and after each one I'll go through, there's, um, a slide which will go through um, an important learning point about pulmonary fibrosis. And my email address is down there um, below my name, just to, um, and you're welcome to email me any questions you might have after the session. Um, pulmonary fibrosis is, I think, isn't very well taught at medical school, and there's, it's, it can be quite confusing, and there's lots of different um, overlapping terms. Um, so to clear one thing up, first of all, by pulmonary fibrosis here, what we mean and what most people mean when they say pulmonary fibrosis is interstitial lung disease. Um, and interstitial, interstitial lung disease is kind of the catch-all phrase for lots of different, with lots of different categories in it. So pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease tend to be, um, tend to mean the same thing when people are talking about it. Um, and here's just some information about QuesMed. So if we go straight on to the first question, um, what we'll do is I'll read out the question and then we'll give you about a minute as Zanya was saying to answer the question. And then after that, we can, um, I'll go through the um, answers. So a 75 year old man presents to the GP with progressively worsening dyspnea over the last year. There is, this is associated with a non-productive cough and fatigue. He has no weight loss or hemoptysis. He has a 20 pack year smoking history and no other past medical history. He's a retired office worker and has no pets. On examination, he has a peripheral cyanosis and fine end inspiratory crackles at both bases on chest auscultation. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So, is it, it's, so the poll is up there. Um, I'll give you some time to answer. Thirty seconds left, guys. Great. So I thought we'd start with a, um, 
a fairly straightforward one. So the um, answer is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so this is a typical presentation of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Now, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a type of interstitial lung disease. Um, and this is kind of typically how it presents. Extrinsic allergic alveolitis is another type of interstitial lung disease that we'll cover later. Um, and that usually requires exposure to um, either um, pets or working on a farm, birds, molds, that type of thing. Asbestosis usually requires exposure to, um, well, requires exposure to asbestos. Um, and usually it will be in the history that the patient works either in construction or on a shipyard or something like that. Um, COPD doesn't usually present with fine end in spiritual crackles and lung cancer also usually doesn't present like this. You would expect hemoptysis and weight loss with lung cancer. Um, so as I said, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a type of interstitial lung disease and it's the most common type of interstitial lung disease. And it's a progressive fibrotic lung disease and it usually has an unknown um, it's, it has an unknown cause, hence the idiopathic um, part of it. Um, patients usually present with, typ typically it will be uh, a man who is around 70 years old or in his 70s, and it's much more common in smokers. Um, and typically patients will present with quite a kind of long progressive history of a cough that isn't productive, they bring up no sputum, they'll get progressively more and more short of breath, and they'll usually have constitutional symptoms like fatigue, joint pains, lethargy, things like that. And they can sometimes get weight loss as well as the disease becomes more severe. On examination, when these patients come to um, hospital, when you see them in hospital, they often have clubbing of their fingers. Um, they're often cyanosed um, due to their hypoxia and on examination of their chest they have kind of very typical findings of these what we call fine end inspiratory crackles so it's crackles that you hear only at the end of inspiration and they're very very fine unlike the coarse crackles that you hear in uh, pneumonia for example and I've got a clip which kind of just demonstrates what I'm describing now people often describe it as velcro so it's like um velcro so if you're so the patient in this um question had kind of that classic history of this progressive lung disease um so that's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis which is a type of interstitial lung disease or a type of pulmonary fibrosis and the most common type that's just the thing again so question two a 67 year old lady presents to the emergency department with progressive worsening of um, her symptoms of shortness of breath, a dry cough and two kilograms of weight loss over the past two months. She has a background of ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, hypertension and type two diabetes. And she is taking bisoprolol five milligrams once a day, amiodarone 200 milligrams once a day, amlodipine five milligrams once a day, atorvastatin 80 once a day, aspirin 75 once a day, and Ramipril five milligrams once a day. She's been taking these medications for the last three years. Currently, she is cyanosed with fine end inspiratory capitations on examination of her chest. Her chest x-ray shows bilateral lower lobe reticular nodular shadowing, and her ECG shows normal sinus rhythm. Which medication is most likely to have caused her presentation? Thirty seconds, guys.
Excellent. So that's um, so most people got that one right as well. So the answer there is amiodarone. Um, amiodarone is a drug um, that can typically cause uh, pulmonary fibrosis. It can also cause um, thyroid problems. So you need to monitor thyroid function with amiodarone as well. Um, usually with the drugs that cause pulmonary fibrosis, it takes months to years of exposure to that drug before any pulmonary fibrosis is caused and pulmonary fibrosis can be caused in about five percent of patients on long-term amiodarone therapy um, the other drugs mentioned there aren't known to cause pulmonary fibrosis um, so this question uh, i wanted to highlight some of the other causes of interstitial lung disease um, so here we've basically i've got a picture of a patient who has amiodarone um, induced pulmonary fibrosis and you can see the horrible um, bilateral shadowing more predominant in the lower lobes but also spreading up to the upper lobes as well um, and that's kind of your, a typical chest x-ray finding of quite severe um, interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis so as we've said the, the the most common cause of interstitial lung disease is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and there are kind of four main other categories. So one of them is medications, as in this question, and some of the more some of the medications that it's important to remember that can cause fibrosis include amiodarone, nitroferantoin, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, and then drugs like bleomycin and busulfan. Um, another category is connective tissue diseases. So pulmonary fibrosis can occur alongside or kind of in a severe um, connective tissue disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis. Also, pulmonary fibrosis can be caused by occupational irritants. Um, so that's things like um, coal worker pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, silicosis, and usually for that you get a um, it's important to take a thorough history from the patient about where they worked and what their occupation was. And the final category is extrinsic allergic alveolitis, which is also known as chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So those are both two different names for basically the same, exactly the same thing. And all that is, is exposure to an, um, an antigen, usually, um, an avian protein, so like um, pigeons or parrots or something, um, or mold antigens like aspergillus and other fungal antigens. Um, so there are two kind of common types of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. One of them is called bird fancier's lung, and the other one is called farmer's lung. Um, so when a patient like this one presents with um, features suggesting pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, um, it's important to take a really thorough history, asking about their occupation, about their recent exposure to, about what pets they have, about whether they've had been exposed to um, asbestos in construction sites or whether they've had pets as birds, or, um, birds as pets or something like that. And then it's important to send all of the kind of autoimmune screen that you would do for any connective tissue disease. Um, and it's important to take a thorough drug history so that you know what medications they've been taking as well. So question number three, a 40 year old man with a history of poorly controlled back pain and non-specific joint pain presents to the emergency department with a one month history of worsening dyspnea on exertion. And this is associated with a non-productive cough and malaise. He was recently treated for a urinary, a urinary tract infection with nitroferantoin by the GP, and he has no other past medical history. So on examination, he has fine end inspiratory crepitations bilaterally, and his chest X-ray is shown um, just to the side there. So his blood and his bloods are currently awaited. So which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this case?
30 seconds, guys. Yeah, so yeah, excellent. So this one's a, a bit more difficult. Um, so the answer here is ankylosing spondylitis. And the main point to notice in this question is, or the main thing I wanted to emphasize is the chest x-ray and where the pulmonary fibrosis is on the chest x-ray. So here you can see on this chest x-ray that you've got all of this um, reticular kind of nodular kind of shadowing these opacities in the upper lobes, especially in the right upper lobe, but also in the left upper lobe. Not really much change in the lower lobes. Um, and the, when you have upper lobe predominant pulmonary fibrosis, there are a few things that it's important to think about. And then um, one of those is ankylosing spondylitis, um, especially in a young patient. Um, with poorly controlled back pain and non-specific joint pain. Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as I've already said, tends to occur in much older people. So it's usually people in their seventies. Um, and that usually predominates, is predominantly in the lower lobes instead of the upper lobes. Asbestosis, um, you would expect a, an occupational history, which the patient doesn't have. Um, also mainly in the lower lobes. Rheumatoid arthritis is a reasonable um, thought, given that he has this non-specific joint pain. But again, it usually is predominantly in the lower lobes. And nitrofurantoin-induced pulmonary fibrosis, although he was on nitrofurantoin um, for a urinary tract infection, and that can cause pulmonary fibrosis, as I said, usually you require months to years of exposure to the medication before you've developed the fibrosis. And medication-induced pulmonary fibrosis tends, again, to be predominantly lower lobe fibrosis. So here you can see, as I said, much more upper lobe predominance. And I've just put the um, chest x-ray here again and put the main causes either side of what affects upper and what affects lower. So in terms of upper lobe predominant pulmonary fibrosis, you tend to, um, tuberculosis tends to be upper lobe. You often see cavitating lesions with tuberculosis though. Um, it's stringsic allergic alveolitis. So that's the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So the thing we were talking about with bird fancy lung or farmer's lung. And closing spondylitis as per this question, typically upper lobe predominant pulmonary fibrosis. And then other rarer causes like radiotherapy and sarcoidosis. Um, lower zone predominant pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis classically starts in the lower zones um, and very much predominant in the lower zones. And then other things like asbestosis, connected, um, other connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid and SLE. And most causes of drug induced pulmonary fibrosis tend to be lower lobe and predom predominant. Um, and those are important kind of um, considerations to think about when thinking about the cause of someone's interstitial lung disease. So question four, a 39 year old man presents to the emergency department with a six month history of worsening shortness of breath on exertion associated with a non-productive cough. He has no past medical history. He smokes 20 cigarettes a day and works on a farm. On examination, his respiratory rate is 33 Oxygen saturations 91% on room air, heart rate 99, temperature 36.5, blood pressure 110 over 79. Auscultation of his chest reveals scattered and respiratory crepitations, but no wheeze. And chest x ray shows bilateral upper lobe reticular nodular shadowing. Spirometry was requested and reveals a restrictive pattern. And acid fast bacilli in three sputum samples were negative. Which of the following is the next best investigation?
30 seconds, guys. Excellent. So the answer for this question is, as most people said, serum precipitins for aspergillus and mold antigens. So this question was a bit of an opportunity to talk a bit more about uh, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis or extrinsic allergic alveolitis, which this is a typical presentation of. Um, so you can see he's got the occupational history, he works in a farm. It's a young patient who's presented with these symptoms suggestive of symptoms and signs suggestive of pulmonary fibrosis. And we've already said he has upper lobe shadowing. And as I said before, it's extrinsic allergic alveolitis can cause upper lobe um, reticular nodular shadowing or pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the rheumatoid factor can sometimes be positive in extrinsic allergic alveolitis, but it's not very um, specific and it's often sensitive in things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis as well. Um, antinuclear antibody, is a good test to look for um, lupus, um, very sensitive to lupus, but here it's not, the history doesn't fit with lupus, he has no other symptoms. Serum ACE is a good screening test for sarcoidosis, um, but pulmonary fibrosis in sarcoidosis is usually at the end stage of sarcoid, end stage of disease in sarcoidosis, um, and this patient has no other symptoms of sarcoidosis. Serum IgE and eosinophils might be a reasonable suggestion if you were thinking about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or ABPA, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, which is present, would present slightly differently to how this patient presented here, um, usually with wheeze and a productive cough. Um, so yeah, you would do serum precipitants for aspergillus and mold antigens. Um, and that's just to check for exposure to these antigens, which could have caused the fibrosis in this case. So in terms of hypersensitivity pneumonitis or extrinsic allergic alveolitis, what basically happens is that you inhale the antigen and that causes a type three or type four hypersensitivity reaction. Um, and you can either present acutely with that or you can present chronically. So acutely you have um, neutrophils will or other inflammatory cells will infiltrate the alveoli and cause um, an acute kind of um, deterioration with cough, shortness of breath, and this interstitial pattern on a chest X-ray, um, like an interstitial pneumonia pattern on a chest X-ray. Whereas um, patients can also present chronically, like the patient in this um, question who presented over six months. And that's where the inhalation of antigens provokes this type 3 or type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, which then results in granuloma formation and interstitial lung disease or fibrosis. Um, the antigens that can cause this, as I've already alluded to previously, um, avian proteins tend to cause this, so parrots, pigeons, those sorts of things. Um, Fungal spores, so things like aspergillus can cause this, and also molds, so various different mold antigens, um, which is why it's so, which is why it's colloquially kind of known as farmer's lung, and why farmers are so prone to it because they're so kind of exposed to molds all the time, and we send serum precipitants to confirm exposure, and serum precipitants basically just means IgG. Um, in terms of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and how the two differ, I always got a bit confused about the difference between these two. Basically, ABPA is a predominantly a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to the aspergillus antigen, um, and that results in eosinophils infiltrating the airways as opposed to other inflammatory cells, and therefore you get a productive cough with wheeze and shortness of breath. 
but and wheeze is quite a kind of significant um, factor in this and that's why this patient who presented in this question is unlikely to have AVPA and although you're exposed to the same antigen different people just have different responses to that aspergillus antigen so some people might have a type 1 sensitive hypersensitive to reaction some people might have a type 3 or type 4 hypersensitive to reaction and those are the differences between ABPA and it's extrinsic allergic alveolitis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, so question five, a 73 year old woman presents to the GP with a three month history of intermittent non-productive cough. And this is associated with dyspnea on exertion, general fatigue and some weight loss. She has a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia and type 2 diabetes. She also has a 40 pack year smoking history. She's a retired accountant and has no pets. On examination, she has a respiratory rate of 26 and oxygen saturations of 94% at rest and 91% on exertion. Chest auscultation reveals scattered fine inspiratory crepitations at both lung bases. Which of the following investigations is most likely to confirm the diagnosis? Thirty seconds, guys. Good. So the answer for that one is high resolution uh, CT. Um, so once again, this is a classic presentation of a um, patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. She presents with all the typical signs and symptoms and she has no uh, exposure history to pets, farms, asbestos, construction, etc. And she has the classical findings on examination. So we can assume this lady has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, how do we, so how do we confirm the diagnosis? So um, chest x-ray is a reasonable investigation to do initially, and probably she would get a chest x-ray before she got a CT. However, uh, chest x-rays can be normal in up to 10% of these patients. So chest x-ray is less likely to be able to confirm the diagnosis here. Um, which is why it's not the right answer. Um, bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage um, tend to be used in patients who have interstitial lung disease of an unknown cause, um, but they've already been kind of diagnosed with interstitial lung disease, and it's to and it helps to find what the cause might be of the interstitial lung disease. Um, so in this case, it's not necessarily needed. Um, before, you don't need to do it before you do the, the CT. Chest ultrasound is not unlikely to be helpful. It's only really helpful for pleural effusions or pneumothorax um, or when you're inserting a chest drain. And although pulmonary function tests will be helpful in this case and might show a restrictive picture or a restrictive pattern, they're not going to help us to confirm what the diagnosis is because lots of things can cause a restrictive pattern on lung function tests. So that's why a high resolution CT is the, is the right answer because it will show up quite clearly the um, fibrosis and what's happening, what's going on in the lungs. Um, so in terms of anyone presenting with this um, history of um, progressive shortness of breath over the last six months and they've got these typical fine spirit, end in spirit through crackles on examination, Although chest x-ray is a good initial investigation to do, 
and may show some um, classification bilaterally. It, chest X-ray can be normal in up to 10% of patients, as I said. And that's why a high resolution CT is kind of going to give us, more likely to give us the diagnosis. And you can see on this CT here that we've got this kind of typical um, reticular nodular shadowing around um, the whole lungs. And then you can see lots and lots of what we call honeycomb lung, where the lung, if you look on the periphery especially, it looks like it's turning into honeycomb. And this is all typical for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it's, and in any patient presenting with this sort of symptom, symptomatology, it's important to get a CT. It's also important to get a spirometry in patients presenting with this shortness of breath over a um, long period of time, because that can really guide your diagnosis as well. Um, but as I said, it's, it's, a spirometry is unlikely to confirm the diagnosis as much as the CT is but definitely helpful in guiding the diagnosis. Um, and it's also important to send off lots of blood tests um, to look for the cause of the interstitial lung disease. As we said in this case, it's most likely to be uh, idiopathic coronary fibrosis, but it's important to rule out those other causes that we've already discussed. So sending things like rheumatoid factor, um, ANA, other autoimmune ant um, antibodies, um, and taking a clear um, and thorough history for things like, as I've already said, exposure to pets, exposure to um, various occupational hazards. Um, so question six, this one might take a bit longer to look through. A 67 year old woman is reviewed in the respiratory clinic. She was referred due to a six month history of dyspnea, initially on exertion, but now at rest. And this is associated with a non-productive cough. A high resolution CT shows evidence of honeycombing. She has just had spirometry and you're reviewing the results. Which of the following spirometry results are most in keeping with this clinical picture? So I'll give you a little bit of extra time to look through each of these and think about these ones. Thirty seconds, guys. Excellent. Um, so as most of you put the right answer is A. Um, so this shows as the FPV1 and the FPC are both lower than they should be. And the FPV1 to FPC ratio is 85%, which is normal. This is a typical restrictive pattern. And the transfer coefficient is also low. Um, which demonstrates basically interstitial lung disease. This is a typical finding on, pulmonary fun on lung function tests um, in a patient with interstitial lung disease. Um, the others aren't correct because in B, this is the typical findings in a normal patient. So they've got normal FEV1, normal FVC, normal FEV1 to FVC ratio, normal transfer coefficient. Um, in C, this is a typical obstructive pattern. And because the transfer coefficient is low, that's what we see in COPD. So C is a typical COPD um, finding in lung function tests. Um, D, the transfer coefficient is quite high, but everything else is normal, which is typically what we see in pulmonary hemorrhage. And E, 
Um, again, it's an obstructive picture, but the transfer coefficient is high or normal to high. And that's what we see in um, asthma. Um, and that you, that you can also do reversibility testing where you give someone subutamol and then redo the lung function. And that usually improves um, in an asthma patient. So uh, the main reason I wanted to ask this question is so that I can talk a bit about um, spirometry or lung function tests. Um, and this is kind of a, 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 a quick kind of graph that I drew to demonstrate how to how to look at lung function tests because they're really important tests to do in any respiratory condition. Um, so the first thing to do um, is to look at the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Um, and if that's above 70%, um, that's that usually means kind of a normal FEV1 to FVC ratio, below 70% an abnormal FEV1 to FVC ratio. So if we go on the left side first, so that FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 70%, um, then you go on to have a look at the FVC. So if the FVC is normal, the force vital capacity is normal, then that demonstrates an obstructive pattern. Um, so that's your COPDs, your asthmas. Um, demonstrating there's airway obstruction. And then you have a look at the transfer coefficient or the transfer factor, which is basically just a, um, a measure of how much air is being adequately exchanged in the lung, um, how much oxygen is being adequately exchanged in the lung and getting into the bloodstream. Um, or you can think of it as being transferred into the bloodstream. Um, so if that's low, then that suggests COPD. If that's normal, it suggests asthma in this kind of thing. And then if you look at the FVC and the FVC is low in a patient with an, an FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 70%, that suggests a mixed pattern. So obstructive and restrictive disease. If we look at the other side of the um, chart, at the if the FEV1 to FVC ratio is above 70%, and then we look at the FVC. So if the FVC is low, that means the FVC and the FEV1 usually are both low, and that's a restrictive pattern. And then again, we can look at the um, transfer factor or the transfer coefficient. And if the transfer coefficient is low in a restrictive pattern, then that indicates interstitial lung disease. That's what we we're looking at here. Whereas if it's if the transfer factor is normal, that suggests that there's enough that suggests that there's not really any pathology with the lung but there's some sort of restrictive pattern and that could be a chest wall disease neuromuscular disease or obesity so something that's causing hypoventilation basically but the lungs themselves are normal if you have a normal FVC on the side of the chart um, and a normal transfer coefficient and that's just a normal result and a high transfer coefficient with all the other results being normal you get pulmonary hemorrhage um, or oh, that's, that's what you see in pulmonary hemorrhage. So question seven, an 81 year old man is reviewed on the acute medical ward. He presented due to a gradual increase in the size of his legs over the last two months. Um, this is associated with worsening abdominal pain, specifically in his right upper quadrant. He was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis five years ago. On examination, he is cyanotic and has a JVP of five centimetres above the sternum notch. On auscultation, he has fine inspiratory crepitations and a pan-systolic murmur, heard loudest at the lower left sternal edge. He has two centimetre hepatomegaly and bilateral pedal edema after his thighs. His chest x-ray demonstrates stable reticular nodular changes compared to his previous, and his ECG demonstrates sinus rhythm with right axis deviation. Which of the following is the next best investigation? Thirty seconds, guys.
Excellent, so there are answers and echo. Um, so this uh, question was to demonstrate some of the complications of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, in lots of patients with lung disease, you see core pulmonale, which is basically right-sided heart failure due to lung disease. Um, and in that you see, um, you can often see um, this pansystolic murmur at the le lower left stern ledge, which is tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and he's got two centimeter hepatomegaly, which is due to congestion, again, right heart, right heart failure, the pilodema up to the thighs, all, all points to right-sided heart failure. And the right axis deviation points to right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and the reason echo is the next best investigation is to is to see what the pulmonary pressures are, to see if he's got an evidence of pulmonary hypertension, and to see how well the right ventricle is working, because this all suggests right ventricular failure due to his um, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, there's not much point in doing a high res CT here because we know that the cause is we know that he's got clinical evidence of heart failure so we want to confirm that with an echo um, and he's got stable change he's got stable changes on his x-ray so he probably doesn't need a, a, another ct because we already know that the diagnosis is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, cardiac mri is a good investigation to do if you are looking for a cause of if you have heart failure of unknown cause um, on an echo and you want to kind of elucidate the cause then you can do a cardiac mri but here, that's not, we don't need to do that at the moment. Coronary angio, angio, again, is a reasonable investigation to request if you're thinking about ischemic cardiomyopathy, but again, in this case, we're, we're not thinking about that. And spirometry will probably show a restricted pattern and is useful in the sense that we can compare it to his previous lung function tests to see if he's got progressive disease, but again, not going to be that useful in terms of um, his right-sided heart failure. Um, in terms of complications of idiopathic, so in terms of complications of idiopathic coronary fibrosis or most causes of interstitial lung disease, you can get type one or type two respiratory failure. So as it progresses, you start off usually with type one respiratory failure. As it progresses even further, you get type two respiratory failure. Um, you're at increased risk of having lung cancer and as I've said with this question, you get core pulmonary, which is right-sided heart failure due to the um, lung disease. And you also have increased risk of respiratory infections. Lots of these patients will um, have recurrent inf bacterial infections with things like Pseudomonas or Klebsiella um, or Staphs, um, things like that. Um, and some of them can even be colonized with these bacteria. So colonized with Pseudomonas, for example. Um, after being infected so many times. Um, so question eight, an 84 year old woman attends respiratory clinic for her annual follow-up. She has end stage idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and reports that her dyspnea is worsening and she now experiences dyspnea at rest. Her respiratory rate is 30, oxygen stats in the clinic are 90% at rest and 85% on exertion. Her chest x-ray in today's clinic shows worsening fibrotic disease. Her spirometry shows an FEC of 40% predicted. She's already registered in a pulmonary rehab program and she stopped smoking when she was first diagnosed with IPF. She's already known to the community palliative care team but has not seen them for a year. Which of the following is the next best step in her management? Thirty seconds, guys.
Excellent. So yeah, the answer here is um, D, refer for long-term oxygen therapy with additional ambulatory oxygen. Um, so this patient has come to clinic, they've got worsening pulmonary fibrosis. We know they've got idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, and their FPC is 40% of predicted, which is very low. Um, and when, so basically she's in the end stage of her disease. And when patients get to the end stage of disease in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or any interstitial lung disease, it's important to start thinking about how we can best control their symptoms. Um, which is why refer for long term oxygen therapy with additional ambulatory oxygen is the most appropriate thing to do here because she's experiencing shortness of breath at rest um, and on exertion and her oxygen saturations are low and probably do an ABG um, in clinic to see what the PO2 was so that we can then prescribe the oxygen, the long term oxygen therapy um, to help with her symptoms. She doesn't have any signs of infection at the moment. She's not coughing up any um, dark sputum or green sputum. So giving a course of antibiotics is, uh, giving broad spectrum antibiotics is unlikely to be helpful in this, um, at this stage, and is more likely to breed resistant microorganisms. Perfenidone and nintetinib are both antifibrin um, drugs that can be used in um, pulmonary fibrosis, they're antifibrosis drugs. Um, but they're only allowed if the FVC is between 50 and 80% predicted. Um, and in terms of long-term steroid therapy, in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, long-term steroid therapy isn't helpful because there isn't, an, or there isn't kind of an immune-mediated process that's driving their pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so steroid therapy, not helpful in, in long-term in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So in terms of the kind of cornerstone of man cornerstones of management for patients with um, interstitial lung disease, but mainly idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, everyone should stop smoking. That's kind of a catch-all for all lung diseases. Stop smoking always improves. Um, and pulmonary rehabilitation programs are really useful for helping patients learn to do breathing exercises and help them to... Um, do exercise, exercises that help with their breathing. In terms of medical therapy, as I've said, once we get towards the end stage of disease, we start thinking about long-term oxygen therapy and palliative care in the community. And we can give things that help patients with their breathlessness, like opiates such as morphine or benzodiazepines such as lorazepam. Those are both really good drugs for um, breathlessness in the end stage of disease. We can um, control symptoms of core pulmonary, um, with things like furosemide, and then there's these anti-fibrosis drugs um, which, called nintedinib and perfenidone, which are currently licensed um, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis if the FVC is between 50 and 80% of predicted. And they don't stop or reverse fibrosis, they just slow the progression of fibrosis. They're quite expensive drugs to use and they're only used in those specific cases. So they don't reverse, they just slow the progression um, by about half. Um, and the only kind of cure, the only thing that will get rid of the, the fibrosis is a long transplant. In terms of steroid use, as I said, steroids shouldn't be used long-term in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But if there's another cause of interstitial lung disease, such as a caused by a connective tissue disease, one of these hypersensitivity pneumonitis or extrinsic allergic cavulitis, then steroids tend to be really, really helpful because there is an immune kind of component uh, or inflammatory mediated component to their lung disease. Um, and so steroids can dampen that down and help prevent that from causing the lung disease. Um, but not usually used, but not used long-term in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so the main message from this point is if you have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, really hard to treat, no actual, there's no actual kind of thing to cure it apart from lung transplant. And it's important to think about symptom control, especially at the end stage of disease. So question nine um, and the final question. A 92 year old man is reviewed on the acute medical unit after presenting with worsening shortness of breath, cough productive of green sputum, 
and right-sided chest pain. He has a background of end-stage idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, hypertension and type 2 diabetes. He is housebound, fully dependent for all activities of daily living and has carers four times a day. His observations are as follows. Respiratory rate 46, SATs 85% on room air, heart rate 120, temperature 36.5 and blood pressure 100 over 60. He has fine crackles throughout his chest and bronchial breathing in the right base, but no wheeze. You commence oxygen therapy and his saturations improve, which the following is the appropriate, the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient. Thirty seconds left, guys. Great, so the correct answer is broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, so again, this patient has pulmonary fibrosis, um, end stage idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And the reason I put this question in is because I wanted to talk about um, thinking about ceilings of care in these patients. So this patient with end stage idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has clearly presented with clinical features of a pneumonia um, in infection. And um, therefore, broad spectrum antibiotics are an appropriate thing to start. Um, he doesn't have any wheeze at the moment, so subutal nebulizers aren't going to be helpful, um, and they'll probably worsen his tachycardia. As I've already mentioned, steroids aren't really useful here because we're treating a pneumonia. We've got a patient with end stage idiopathic coronary fibrosis where steroids aren't really helpful anyway. Um, if the patient had an exacerbation of a different type of lung disease such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis then introducing steroids or doubling up his steroids might be helpful but as this patient has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis steroids don't really play a role in in this one and intubation and ventilation or non-invasive ventilation both of them not needed at the moment because the saturation is improved with just normal oxygen therapy but also not really appropriate in patients with end stage idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because it's unlikely to work and the patients are at much higher risk of pneumothorax and the patients are unlikely to be able to come off of the ventilation because their lung disease is so bad. And his baseline is also quite bad. He has, he's housebound, he has carers four times a day. So he's unlikely to be able to survive if he were to require non-invasive ventilation or intubation and ventilation. Um, and yeah, just to kind of highlight that this is a, this, well, this is a lung from an autopsy of a patient who had who died of um, pulmonary fibrosis, and you can see kind of how scarred and thick and um, fibrose this this lung is. Um, it's a in this is for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a horrible disease. The mortality from um, data diagnosis is there's about fifty percent mortality five years in from date of diagnosis. And therefore it was really important to discuss ceilings of care with these patients um, and discuss um, kind of advanced care planning, making sure that symptoms are controlled. Um, so on that um, light note, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can email me on my email address at the start, or you can email this email address here and here are some of the um, QR codes to get the to get the Quesned app as well. Um, 
Zanya, did you have anything else to say or should I jump straight into the questions? Uh, no, just quickly before we jump into the questions, thank you so much for those who did attend uh, the site, uh, attend the session. It was an absolutely fantastic session. I definitely learned a lot. Um, if you guys could please fill in the feedback forms, I popped the links in the chat. Um, and yeah, without any further ado, you can head on Dr. Amy with the questions. 